Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this week on Crypto Journey. Today we have Tim Doyle as a special guest. Uh, Tim is one of New Zealand's leading cryptocurrency accountants. He's been involved in IRD consultations on crypto tax and he submitted several short form bindings, binding rulings to IRD on behalf of cryptocurrency clients. Tim himself has been a crypto investor since 2017. Let's make this an interactive session, so please feel free to ask any questions throughout and I'll pass them on to Tim to answer. All yours, Tim. Oh, thanks very much, Julia. Uh, I my screen and hopefully this is the right one. Cool, so I think everyone should be able to see my screen now, give us a yell if you can't. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Julia, and um, thanks for the DASIT team for having me on today. Uh, if you're interested in a copy of these slides, uh, I can email them to you afterwards as well. My email address will be on the last slide. Um, just before we get into things, a little bit of a disclaimer, you know, because we are accounting and tax professionals. So this information has been prepared for informational purposes only. It should not be intended to provide legal and should not be relied upon for legal tax and accounting advice. You should own your you should consult your own legal tax and accounting advisors before engaging in any transaction. So this is what we're gonna to cover today. Uh, in a moment before we get into this, I'm actually gonna cover off and talk about two sort of key concepts just to give some structure to the conversation. And then we're gonna go through these particular topics. Uh, some of them you might find a little bit technical and a little bit dry, however, it will improve later on. Um, so if you do find the first particularly five or 10 minutes when we look into some of the, the legislation and some of the reasons why cryptocurrency is taxable, just bear in mind that that's the only part that is a little bit dry. Um, and my intention is to let you know that up front and get it over the way and to set a foundation that we can use to then build on. So with that in mind, um, let's talk about these two core concepts first. And you'll see here, I've got a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And sometimes as tax professionals and accountants, we find that there's a bit of this misalignment happening. And that misalignment mostly happens when cryptocurrency is being used as a currency in terms of loan, earning interest, transactionals, moving money or wealth around but it's being taxed as property. And this is where we have this misfit of the income tax legislation applying to cryptocurrency. And we'll definitely point out some of those examples as we go through today's session. Uh, and there is some uncertainty about these uh, tax concepts, particularly with crypto because it's new. And I don't think it's really been contemplated under the existing tax act legislation. The other core concept that I wanted to outline right at the start here is this, that again, we've got this collision between digital assets and fiat, fiat currency. And what I mean by that is quite often when we talk about traders or you read articles online, you'll see that most people say that, hey, profits aren't real until they're in your bank account in cash. And as a tax professional, I, I really encourage you to think differently on that because what we've seen so far is actually the opposite. It's very easy to transact in large sums of money online that have wealth. And by doing so, the outcome of that is significant tax consequences, but you're not gonna have any cash in your bank account to pay the tax because all of the wealth and all of the profits are still tied up in crypto it can be hit you pretty hard and it can be quite a big shock to the system where you've done all of these transactions and you might not have taken out any cash, but you've seen the increase in value of your portfolio to all of a sudden been hit with a big significant tax bill that you haven't contemplated. And this is what I refer to as this, again, this collision, uh, collision between digital assets and fiat currency. So to give you some structure or an example around that, uh, just last week, um, we've got a client, we knew about this, we talked about it at the time, so it wasn't a surprise to him, but I think when, we, as you'll go through the story, it really kind of hit home. And what happened in that situation is that he minted an NFT, which was incredibly successful in September last year, and he received about 25,000 Solana. And at the time, that was worth about $1.6 million in New Zealand dollar terms. 
And then up until Christmas, he moved the Solana around back and forth. And with the market conditions, that grew to about $9 million New Zealand. Then at 31st of March, 22, the end of the financial year, it was worth $7 million. And in this particular search situation, we were able to claim the write down of the loss from 9 million to 7 million and, and, and claim that unrealized gain. And that was some particular uh, trading stock rule principles that apply to that individual. So in summary, he's got a $7 million taxable gain to 31 March 22, and he's got a tax liability on that. And rather than cashing out any money when he earned the soul or when it increased in value to put aside for tax, he kept his Solana. He kept all of the $7 million in Solana. And after the 31st of March, that $7 million is now worth about $3 million. It's dropped in value. And in that situation, although he's lost $4 million after 31 March, we can't offset that loss against a prior year profit. So the outcome is, is that he's got tax to pay on $7 million, and you can do the maths there at 28 or 39% tax, but he's only got about $3 million of Solana left. So in this situation, he has to liquidate all of his Solana to pay his tax bill because of the different periods that the, the gain in one period and the loss in the other period. So that's a, a real hit home reality of all of this wealth in the crypto space that's been created but nothing's been realized in fiat, yet the tax liability is still incredibly significant. And of course, you're probably wondering, is that fear? Well, no, I don't think it's fear, that's for sure. He hasn't actually realized any of this, uh, but IRD and the Income Tax Act is saying that these trades between tokens are taxable events and the wealth is in cryptocurrency and that's where the tax burden comes from. So with that in mind, as we cover off um, and get into the sort of first, a bit of a meaty conversation here. And this is probably where particularly a couple of years ago, uh, we tested IRD on this quite extensively with multiple binding rulings. And a binding ruling is when we take the facts of a particular taxpayer, we decide what income tax legislation applies to those facts and then present it to IRD. And IRD either come back and they say, yes, we agree with you, this is the right tax treatment, or they say, no, we don't agree with you, this is the outcome because of these reasons why. So to set the scene a little bit, there was this uh, high court case in 2020 with a company that we probably all know called Cryptopia down in Christchurch, which went into liquidation. And the outcome of that high court case was that the judge confirmed that cryptocurrency is, is, is property. And personal property is property that isn't land. So therefore, cryptocurrency is personal property. And there's a particular part of the Income Tax Act, Section CB4, that outlines an amount that a person derives from disposing of property or personal property is income of that person if they acquired that property for the purpose of disposing it. And rather than read that again, basically it's saying if you buy cryptocurrency with the intention to dispose the proceeds or the profit or the gain is gonna be taxable income. And that's in the Income Tax Act. And there's particularly, if you wanna go into further detail, there's some case law there, the leading cases, nas national distributors, and what the judge decided in that particular case was that it, it's important to look at the taxpayer's intention at the time of acquisition. So it's when you're buying it, that's when your intention is set. So if anyone going, oh, I'm buying cryptocurrency not to dispose, I'm buying it to earn income stream from staking. Well, if you bought cryptocurrency before the staking protocol was available, then it's pretty difficult to have that argument because at an at acquisition, when you first acquired crypto, you couldn't do what you intended to do. So the outcome of those binding rulings, which we've, we've tested IRD on a lot with a variety of different factors, have all been um, not positive for the taxpayer, which has been a little bit frustrating. But when we dive into some of the reasons why, it's actually quite difficult to prove this non-taxable position. And the outcome, the outcome of that is, is that the taxpayer needs clear and compelling evidence that the cryptocurrency isn't acquired with the intention to dispose. 
And rather than being uh, innocent until proven guilty as a criminal case, it's actually flipped. The onus is on the taxpayer to show that their evidence and, and their position is correct. The relevant factors about cryptocurrency need to be considered. And, and IRD have commented on this on their website. Um, and their position is that crypto and Bitcoin don't provide an income stream or any benefits except when they're sold or exchanged. And therefore, they strongly suggest that cryptocurrencies are generally acquired with the purpose to dispose them. And the nature of crypto is it's intangible. We can't touch it. We can't see it. It's digital. And there's no personal benefit to hold audit and IRD take these factors and then they say that therefore it strongly indicates that was it was acquired for the dominant purpose of ultimately disposing it and it's not like clothes that keep us warm uh, it's not like a car which provides us with transport or it's not like a bed that we can sleep in so arguably there's no benefit to us holding it unless we dispose it back to the monetary system the other relevant factors about cryptocurrency is that it generally is highly speculative and volatile values. And this has been demonstrated with significant increases and decreases in tokens, not only recently, but now in the, in the 2017 bull run, the 2018 market drop. For anyone that's getting into crypto, I think that they'd have to be hiding under a rock to not know that it's incredibly speculative. And therefore, the factors suggest that you're buying it as a speculative investment to make money from. If people are borrowing money to buy crypto, it's likely that the loan needs to be repaid. Therefore, a disposal of the tokens is likely and contemplated to repay the loan. And again, this suggests that you're acquiring the crypto to dispose. If you think that you're buying crypto to earn staking rewards and therefore it's not to dispose, unfortunately, you're a bit out of luck too. And again, we've tested this with IRD. And what they've said, their words, not mine, is that some of the staking rewards might only be 4% or 6% or 20% return per annum, but that compared to some of the underlying volatility of say the, the actual token itself might be insignificant. So for example, on Celsius or BlockFi, you can get somewhere around four to 10% return on Bitcoin, but Bitcoin has gone up 800% over the past, well, I don't know if Bitcoin's gone up 800%, but some tokens have gone up that amount of over um, the past 12 months. And IRD have also mentioned that to the taxpayer or to, to you as the, the investor, the staking rewards actually have no benefit to you until they're disposed to fiat currency. And again, this is what we talked about at the start with the square peg trying to go into this round hole, is that unlike dividends, which are, which are received from shares, or rent, which is received from property, the dividends and the rent are money, whereas the staking rewards are property for tax purposes. I'll say that again, the dividends, interest at the bank, rent received, all come in in money. So yes, they're taxable income, but they're not property, which is what staking rewards are. So therefore, the staking rewards need to be disposed to money to have some benefit. And therefore, IRD will say that even if you're staking, you're acquiring them to, for the purpose of dispose, disposal because you need to sell them to therefore get the benefit from it. Finally, and again, last bit of sort of technical detail before we go into some more um, practical information is that there's the IRD has actually got this the question and answers or this issue paper around are the proceeds from gold bullion taxable income and there's several cases in this document but the majority of them are that they're all taxable on disposal again very similar to crypto that gold doesn't have any value to it until you dispose it However, there is one case in that document that outlines a non-taxable position. And I'm just going to highlight that now because it does show the clear and compelling evidence provided from the taxpayer to achieve a non-taxable position. So in this particular case, um, if you want to have a look at it, it's case Q109. The taxpayers were Asian immigrants to Australia. And they purchased bullion to protect their capital and to provide for their children's financial futures. 
accordance with some of their cultural custom, which is on their death, they pass over their wealth and precious metals to their children. And they later disposed of the bullion. And as I mentioned, the outcome from the proceeds was that it was non-taxable. And the reason for the non-taxable position, so this is the clear and compelling evidence part, was that because their purpose on acquisition, what we talked about earlier, was to acquire the, the bullion to gift to their children on their death in accordance with their cultural custom. And neither of them could foresee a future a future situation where it might be necessary for them to sell all or some of the bullion for their personal benefit. Furthermore, at the time of acquisition, it was probably not feasible for anyone to have confidently predicted the remarkable rise in the value of bullion, particularly over a short period of time. And sorry, I'm not too sure if I covered this, but at the time of acquisition, the taxpayer's financial position was sound. So I just want to emphasize that there, there was no future situation where it was likely that they would sell the bullion, and again, due to their personal situation and the facts of this particular case. So when we look at that and apply those sort of facts and, and that evidence to cryptocurrency, we know already that the cryptocurrency is going to be likely to significant increases and decreases over time. And I'm unsure that there's any cultural customs relating to gifting off cryptocurrency to family members at death, at death, which is what the situation was in this particular case. And regarding the financial um, sound financial position at the time of acquisition, well, that's going to be independent or dependent on the particular your particular circumstances. Um, but if that were part of your argument, you'd need to show that you're financially sound and that there's no reason why you'd ever have to sell the crypto in the first place. So just um, changing tax slightly now into why crypto or what is a taxable event. And this is where we quite often get just a little bit of misunderstanding. So if you buy crypto, it's not a taxable event. There's nothing to do. If you just buy and hold, there's nothing to do until you sell it. So from an administration perspective and from a simplistic perspective, it's actually best just to buy cryptocurrency and do nothing with it until you want to sell it. And that way you defer any tax to the sale time and you don't interrupt the compounding cycle. Um, selling crypto for fiat, so back to New Zealand dollars is a taxable event. And also trading one token for another is a taxable event. So if you buy Bitcoin, you sell it for Ethereum, the sale of the Bitcoin is taxable and the purchase of Ethereum is not taxable. It just happens that they happen on the same transaction. So using crypto to purchase goods or service is a taxable event. Again, you're selling the cryptocurrency to acquire something else and staking income is a taxable event. And the staking income is calculated at the market value on the day that those tokens are received. So looking at how cryptocurrency is taxed, um, it's a bit like a retail store. The sale value, the profit equals the sale value minus the purchase value. So a very simplistic example, another transaction and this is where some of the complexity or, or misunderstanding when you purchase ethereum as part of the trade you need to keep track of the sale of bitcoin and as we talked about in the previous slide, the sale value is what you sold it for. And then you need to go back and look at what you purchased it for. And then at the same time, when you're buying that Ethereum, that Ethereum becomes your purchase price. And you need to keep track of that because when you sell the Ethereum, that purchase price will be deductible. So with these trades, I quite often compare it to a retail store, just a non-crypto example to try and understand it a little bit more detail. So let's say I'm a shoe shop, I buy some shoes for $100, I then sell them for $200.
Now in that situation, I've made a $100 profit. And then I take the $200 from the sale price and it goes into the bank account, but then it immediately comes out and goes to the supplier to buy two more pairs of shoes for $100 each. So in that situation, I've still got my $100 profit from the original sale, but I don't have any cash because the $200 from the sale has immediately been recycled or automatically reinvested to two more pairs of shoes for $100 each. So I've made $100 profit, I've got tax to pay, but I don't have any cash to pay the tax because the $200 from the sale has been gone into more stock or more trading stock or more shoes. And this is exactly what happens with cryptocurrency. So if we look at how IRD uh, taxes crypto and a bit of what IRD are doing in the space at the moment, I've got this nice table here. Again, it's a little bit technical. Um, and what we've talked about already is you'll see there section CB4. And that's when crypto is acquired for the purpose of disposal. And that's how most people will be captured under the tax uh, income tax act. There's some other parts to be aware of. Um, section CB1 is business income. And these are for people that are dealing in cryptocurrency. So a simple kind of way to make that distinguishment is that if you're a speculative investor or if you're involved in investing in cryptocurrency, it's likely to be taxed as section CB4. Um, but if you're someone who's dealing in cryptocurrency, more like a trader type of activity or someone like an exchange or like a retailer like Dasset, then um, you'll be taxed under section CB1 business income. There's also the staking income. And as I mentioned, that's taxable income to you based on the market value at the time that you receive it. And that's taxed under ordinary concepts. And then there's a few other parts such as profit making scheme. Um, this is someone who's not in business, but they receive or dispose of crypto as part of profit making. We haven't really seen too much guidelines from IRD about what a profit making scheme would be as opposed to intention, but maybe think some um, ICO sort of type arrangements might come under that as well. Effectively, it's all taxable. Um, it's just different parts of the Income Tax Act allow different expenses to be claimed and might have different um, tax um, rules around some of the trading stock. So like I mentioned in that very early example, the, the, the taxpayer was allowed to claim a write down of unrealized losses because they were in the business of creating NFTs, they had a business income, so the trading stock rules applies. Whereas someone who's just an investor won't be able to claim any unrealized losses. For them, the losses were only realized when they sell crypto. So again, just focusing a little bit more around IRD and what they're doing in the space, they do have a wide range of um, guidelines on their website, and that's been posted in, in I think the first guidelines were posted in late 17 and they've continued to update that but if we just look at what's been happening at IRD they had the tax working group which was commissioned by the Labour government to look at uh, capital gains tax in New Zealand and that involved quite a lot of resources from the IRD to late, 2000, late 2017 to February 2019 and then COVID came along I've, I've hopefully put March 22 as the end date for that as things start slowly start to get back to normal but that's had a massive effect on IRD not only have they had several staff away sick um, but they've also had to administer things like the wage subs subsidy the research support um, subsidy cash flow loan schemes and as tax agents I can tell you it's been difficult to keep up with all these different subsidies and all these different legislation requirements not only to implement the legislation in the first place and then actively manage it um, so they've been having to deal with a lot of that and now they're also dealing with the audits um, following that too and, and following things up and the administrator of it too. They upgraded the IT system in October 21 and more recently with this recent budget that came out, um, the living payment allowance is coming up, which I read in the media is going to take about 750 staff full time from July to, to the rest of the year to administer that. And in the crypto space, they've had some key staff leave as well, who we've got to know pretty well, working closely with them over the past five years now. 
Um, most people, firstly, let me assure you that I work for my clients, um, not the IRD, there's no doubt about that. Um, but the staff at IRD, they are pretty ordinary people. Um, some of them are very intelligent. They're actually good to work with too. And last November, I actually co-presented with IRD at a tax conference with Chartered Accountants Australia New Zealand. It was a presentation to other uh, tax agents and other tax professionals and chartered accountants. And it was a good chance for, for me to have a look behind the scenes at some of their policy work, what they're working on, um, what their issues are at the moment, um, and, and so forth. And they're quite under-resourced in this area when that's not surprising looking at the changes that have happened at IID over the past three or four years in COVID. So the only real IRD audits that we've seen have actually come from other areas in terms of property transactions. And by property, I mean real estate where the taxpayer needs an IRD number and that IRD number is automatically going to IRD's system, which, which looks up the purchase and the sale price. But this, this presentation, um, we discussed several transactions, several specific cryptocurrency transactions with them. And it was a little bit frustrating at the time because they haven't got quite clear guidelines or they themselves don't actually know how some transactions will be taxed. And clearly this is where that uncertainty comes from that I talked about right at the start for us as tax agents trying to give you guys the best possible advice, but firstly, this is something that hasn't been contemplated. Uh, the crypto is being used as money, but taxed as property. And, and thirdly, there's no guidelines, there's no test cases, either in New Zealand or overseas jurisdictions. So we're kind of left with doing the best that we can, sensing that there is likely some risks with some positions, but that's the best that we can do for now. Of course, there is this IRD binding ruling process where if you want certainty, we can go down that path. But the reality is, is that it's quite expensive. It typically costs um, somewhere around six to $15,000 to get certainty on an outcome. And it can take three months. And we know that crypto markets change so much in three months that that's not really a viable option for most people. So one of those issues that we, um, that, that came up when we presented with IID was um, these factors of the centralized phone, finance loans or staking arrangements. And I'll just dive into a few of the details around some of these. Um, so you can get an understanding of, of this, this, this issue with, with crypto as property, but being used as money. Uh, so when we talk about a transfer from one cryptocurrency wallet to another wallet, that's not a taxable event. And the reason why is because the taxpayer still owns the cryptocurrency and it hasn't been disposed. However, when they were, if they were to move crypto from say their, their Binance exchange, which they have custody and control over to say one of these centralized platforms by, by that I mean something like Celsius or, or BlockFi or Nix, Nixo. If you actually read the terms and conditions of part of those agreements, they outlined that the, the, you're giving up rights to the ownership and control of the crypto when you make that deposit to them. And when you think about this practically, it, it actually makes a bit of sense um, because then it allows the it allows the the platform to then on lend it, and that's how they make their money. That's their business model. They they take your crypto, they add a margin on it, they they pay you a return, add a margin on it, and charge the lender more. And to do so, that you need to give up ownership and control. Collateral lend it out to borrowers. And clearly, this is where the risk of those platforms come into play. Um, so, for example, if the borrower doesn't repay their loan, the crypto market goes up or down, the platform's hacked or the crypto is stolen, you, you're, in, you're up for grabs, you, you lose your crypto, and that's where the risk comes into play. So, from a tax perspective, the question is, is that by giving up ownership, because that's what the terms and conditions state, and that's what you're agreeing to, if you give up ownership, is, are you disposing your cryptocurrency? And if you're disposing your cryptocurrency, then we know that it's a taxable event. So IRD, they want to dot the I's and cross the T's, apply it to legislation, look at the, the reality of the contract. And if the contract says you're giving up ownership and control, then they see that as a disposal. Of course, they weren't 
coming out and just saying it was taxed that way, but that's the way that they look at these types of arrangements. They, their, their job is not to look at things from a common sense approach, it's to look at how the income tax act applies. So there's a whole other uh, rabbit hole that we could go down here during financial arrangements, but I'm gonna save the dry and boring stuff and keep this at a high level. But my view of that arrangement is that it's not a disposal of crypto when you transfer um, your Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or whatever token it is to these platforms. And the, the reason why I don't think it's a disposal is because if you look at contract law, when you dispose the crypto to those wallets, to BlockFi, you're not receiving anything in return for doing so. Um, it's not like a trade where you say, on Binance, sell Bitcoin for Tether, you're receiving the Tether back for it. But in these platforms, it's just a one-sided transaction. You're just parking your crypto there. So when you deposit cash with the bank, it's still your money, it's still your cash in the bank, despite having the bank having ownership and control over it. Also, if it was a disposal, then it's uncertain around what the value of that disposal would be. And if you're not, if the disposal is zero dollars, then you'd be unable to have a, a deduction on your original purchase price because we know profit equals your sale value less your purchase value. And, and finally, my view why this isn't a disposal is because if you do, um, you're going to receive rewards from making the deposit. So you can't receive rewards or income from something if you don't own the underlying assets as well. Um, so you can't receive rent from a property if you don't own the property. You can't receive dividends from a share if you don't own any shares. You can't receive interest from a term deposit if you haven't got the term deposit. So therefore, how can you receive staking rewards if you don't own the token that's being staked? So that was just a, an example of one of these situations where there's uncertainty. Um, we've got this square peg trying to fit into this round hole and, and this arises because crypto is being taxed as property, not as money. There's a whole bunch of other situations, particularly in decentralized finance, um, when you're depositing cryptocurrency into a wallet and taking out a, lot, a, a loan, and that again is becoming more popular, um, particularly over the past six months as people have gone more and more into crypto and there's more of these opportunities becoming available too. So th th again, that's something else that, that's relatively untested. And in general, loaning crypto as itself, if you think about a car, um, say I've got a vehicle and you want to borrow it or you want to loan it off me, well, you're not loaning the value of the car from me, um, which is how most people would think. So for example, if I have a Bitcoin, say that Bitcoin's worth 50K and I give it to you, um, the value of that loan is not 50 grand. Um, and to another non-crypto example of that, is if I've got, a, say, the, the car um, lease place has got a car and say it's an Audi um, RS6, it's worth 200 grand. Um, if I lease that car, the lease value isn't 200 grand, it's only about 20 or 30 grand a year. So when I loan something, I'm not loaning the value of the crypto or the value of the asset. The loan has a completely different value based on the lease agreement associated with it. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about record keeping now. And most people um, with their record keeping, they think, oh, it's on the blockchain. There's going to be a record of every single transaction on the blockchain. And although that might technically be correct, I think it's a really dangerous position to be in. And it's not something that I recommend. So just to give you some background information here, what we do is crypto accountants is we take all of your transactions from different wallets from different exchanges and we convert it all to a standardized format and, and this takes quite a lot of time and effort from our end and the more activity you have the more complicated it is, it is. and if the information is incomplete there's something missing the data won't reconcile and this therefore creates risk to the IRD because there's lots of unexplained transactions so on the blockchain uh, yes, we do see all the transactions. We see what comes into your wallet, what comes out to your wallet, and the tokens that are swapped. So think a bit, think a little bit about this, um, like your bank account statement. So if everyone's probably familiar with a bank account, on it you'd have the date, 
you'd have what's came in, what's gone out, and a cumulative balance. And if we think about this like the blockchain, uh, sorry, if we just go back to your bank account, let's say I go to Briscoe's uh, and I spend my FBOS card and I spend 200 bucks on some pots and pans. Now, when I look at my bank statement, I'm going to see that that transaction was at Briscoe's. And likewise, if I went to Mitre 10, it's going to be Mitre 10 FPOS transaction. It's not going to tell me what I bought, but it's going to tell me who I spent the money with. And the receipt's going to tell me what I bought. Likewise, if you have a deposit into your bank account, in a bank account um, it might have salary and then who you work for. So what this does is when us as accountants take those transactions, we can see them. We can see, okay, cool, this is your salary received. This is a transaction at Frisco and what business you're in might determine um, how we account for that transaction. If you're, say, a restaurant down the road and you bought something at Briscoe's, we likely know it's going to be something to do with operating your business and therefore it's deductible. When we look at transactions on the blockchain, we don't know who the money's to and we've got no idea what it's for. We only see the contract address and a whole bunch of, of numbers and letters where it's sent to and we don't know that. So we're not mind readers and it's likely that you're going to forget if particularly if you're making a transaction 12 months ago, who that's been sent to. So in your wallet, you might have a deposit received. We need to know who's that from and what's it for. If you've got crypto going out, again, we need to know who that's, who that's from and what's that for. It's your crypto, um, it's taxable. IRD could come along and ask you that. So uh, the blockchain's not going to give us, it's going to see the transaction, it's going to capture us, but it's not going to have those further details to let us know how to account for it. Um, so using a trade diary there or keeping really good records can help. And again, I've got there, the last point I've got there is some strategic decision making. If you've got all these transactions going on, it's really complicated, but is actually that the best way to make money? Uh, and I can tell you that the, our clients who make the most money, they have a small pot of six to 12 tokens and they don't touch them. Uh, it's very easy to trade, very easy to go to ICO, to margin trading, to staking, to all these different tokens and platforms and chase the next shiny thing. I can tell you from experience in preparing over 200 tax returns that that's not how um, the most successful, and by successful, I mean those that make more than a million bucks from crypto, um, that's not what they do but that's what everyone thinks they, does, they do, and, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I'm just going to give you an example here of a, of a transaction from the blockchain. Um, and, and you'll see here that in, in this particular situation, this is what we see. And it's pretty difficult to actually know what's going on in this transaction. And again, I'm not an expert in reading transactions from the blockchain, but I couldn't tell you what's going on here just from looking at it. And I did write down what it actually is happening and I can't seem to, oh, so here we go. So this transaction is rewards being claimed from a convex contract so that the, the taxpayer in the situation had already deposited um, tokens into this particular convex smart contract. And then in this particular transaction, this is CRV being earned. And then it's been automatically converted into CVX CRV and restaked. But again, there's no way for us to know just by looking at this transaction on the blockchain that that would be what's going on. It's, it's nearly, um, uh, yeah, there, there's more. And this is just one, one trade. So if you've got 10,000 of these, um, you're up for a pretty hard time in terms of deciphering it all from a tax perspective because as we talked about earlier, if you've got rewards being claimed, well, that's taxable income. And then you've got the CRVs being automatically converted to CVX CRV, so that's a taxable income. And then you've got these quantities being needed to be added to your existing quantities on hand as well. So that needs to be captured. And you've got this nightmare of a transaction on the blockchain train to try and understand that. So my point here is that keeping good records is absolutely fundamental and don't rely on the blockchain, um, be a professional. And, and finally, just before we move to the, the question and answer section, I just thought I'd touch base on a few things here. <clears throat> 
So some of the recent tax changes is that for individuals um, with income above $180,000, they pay tax at a marginal tax rate of 39%. So what that means is that if you've got a job and your income from your job is $180,000, all of your crypto income will be taxed at 39%. And that's quite a difficult pill to, spoil, uh, to swallow. And it, it can be, like I mentioned earlier, it can interrupt that compounding cycle quite significantly. And it's gonna be painful when you have to sell crypto, creating further taxable events just to cover your tax bill. So again, what I talked about most of our successful clients, what they do is they buy and they just hold and they don't sell because then they don't have to pay tax until ultimately they, they, they do sell. And then when they sell, they immediately pay their cash. So they avoid that collision between digital assets and fair currency and they get on top of everything. So with the tax rate of 39%, Knowing that, the obvious structure is to have a cryptocurrency company and a company pays tax at 28% until dividends are paid out to shareholders. So the company can sort of ring fence profits at 28% year on year until that dividends are paid out on wind up or, or when the money's taken out. If the dividends paid to an individual, then the individual would still pay an 11% 11, 11 further tax so although you get the short-term benefit of 28%, if the, if the individual's the shareholder of the company, um, there, there isn't, there's a time value money of benefit having the 28% tax rate, but the 39% is only deferred until that dividend's paid. So that's when a trust can come in as the majority shareholder and trusts pay tax at 33% compared to the marginal tax rate of 39% and there's a 6% tax saving there for, for trust. Um, now, before you jump out and do this, obviously everyone is doing this because the tax rate's gone up. So IRD are looking at these likely like a hawk and therefore you need some commercial justification for doing so. That might be things like you've got risk um, in terms of commercial risk, you need asset protection, relationship property reasons, other businesses that might be affected by what you're doing. Um, but there can be some significant tax savings there, but uh, tax definitely needs to be only a small component of the wider picture of why you're doing that restructure. And that's something that needs to be quite individualized to the, to the person. Um, restructuring needs to be at market value too. So you can't just transfer crypto into the new company and, and, and take off. Uh, it needs to be a sale at market value, which will be a taxable event to the individual. So the structure is only likely to provide benefits going forward. Uh, it's going to reset the cost basis. So you've got to draw a line in the sand and anything up until that point now is taxable in your own name, if that's who owns the crypto. And then going forward, um, you might get the benefit of this as something that's of interest to you. Uh, there's also other risks as well. Um, the trust tax rate could increase to 39%. We don't know what's gonna happen with the government. And in this situations to do something like this, there needs to be you need to have a significant amount of crypto or wealth, um, I, I think, to make it worthwhile. Because one, we're only talking about a 6% tax saving. Um, and it's only 6% above $180,000. So if you've got an extra $100,000, the cost, the tax savings of this is $6,000 a year. Um, but you've all of a sudden now got two entities that you need to be compliant with, to administer, to have financial statements prepared for. So you're your administration costs increase as well. So you need to have the full picture before you jump in and do something like this. And that likely involves an accountant and a solicitor as well. Um, finally, and probably topical for most people, as I mentioned at the start, if you've got a loss for the current year to date, 23 year, you can't offset that against a prior year profit. Um, you could do that in 2020 and 2021, um, that I, again, the IRD passed some special COVID legislation to be able to do that. It, there was talk about it being extended to the 2022 year, uh, but that, that's gone on the back burner for now. So if you um, have got a loss for the year to date and you've still got a massive profit for the 22 year, you've likely got tax to pay on that 22 year. 
And therefore you've probably got quite a key decision to make is do I cash out and pay the tax now and get it over and done with, that's gonna hurt. Or do you keep your profits invested in crypto, um, extend the tax, which isn't due for payment until February or April next year, depending on the tax amount and a few other factors, leave your funds invested in crypto and ride the market. But bear in mind, if it goes down further, you're still going to have that tax to pay on the 22 profit, which could get quite uncomfortable. Um, so again, there's, that's, that's that real ugly collision between digital assets and um, the fiat currency system. And it might be that you haven't even taken out any of those 2022 profits in, in cash and haven't had any benefit of them yet they've completely, what the tax burden's completely wiped you out if, if your portfolio has dropped um, since then. So again, I think that just highlights this need to be really strategic around what you're doing with your crypto. It's very easy to sit beside a computer, uh, behind a computer, trade lots, follow people on YouTube, um, chase shiny objects and new tokens, uh, but understanding the tax has significant complications um, and, and really important to understand. Tim, can I just stop you there? And um, we've got a question from Mark. Yeah. Can you please give an, an actual number, examples, a, example of someone buying crypto, then swapping it with another token, having made a profit, then selling some of those new tokens to buy some product, example, some furniture in crypto, and how much tax would you pay at each point? Great question. Oh my gosh, it, it does get quite complicated, doesn't it? Far out. Yep. Um, so, so if we run through that example, if we just uh, drill into that, into the different components. So let's say they bought, what was the example, sorry? Um, so the example, um, some furniture and crypto and how much tax would he pay at each point? Do you want me okay. to I can repeat the question if you... So say, let's just use this example. So say you started with $10,000 and let's just say that was one Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, the Bitcoin price went to $20,000 and you sold that Bitcoin. In that situation, you'd have a $10,000 profit. So let's just park that $10,000 profit to one side. And let's say that the $20,000 then went into Ethereum. And then let's say the Ethereum price increased to $40,000. And then at $40,000, you sold the Ethereum to buy the furniture. So there's two transactions there. The first one is the sale of Bitcoin. And the profit equals the sale value, 20,000, less the purchase price, 10,000. So in that first transaction, there's a $10,000 profit. And then in the second transaction, it's again, the same formula, sale price, 40,000, which that was the value of the Ethereum when they disposed it to buy the furniture, less the purchase price or the acquisition value, which was 20,000. So there's a $20,000 profit on the second transaction. So we combine those together and that's a $30,000 profit and that would be included as income in their tax return at the end of the financial year. And the tax rate on that will depend on all of your other income. And um, there's an article on our website, cryptocurrencytax.co.nz. It says, how much, do I, how much tax do I pay on my gains? And that will give you an understanding. It depends on your marginal tax rate, other income, and a whole bunch of other factors. Um Thank you very much. So we've also got another question. So um, Jonathan said he's bought ETH to stake and earn income, but maybe in five or 10 years time, he'll sell it. Is there a possibility of a bright line and when I sell it tax free? Uh, no, so the bright line test only applies to residential property. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and crypto is classified as personal property. So completely different tax rules from the bright line test, um, but the proceeds from selling Ethereum in five years is likely to be taxable if you've purchased it with the intention to dispose under that section CB4. And is um how, like are the I is the IID really cracking down on this? I mean, it's such a new sort of grey area. So I guess we're all sort of thinking, <laughs> when are we? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's um. As I mentioned, as I said, we haven't really seen too much IID activity yet. Um, what we are aware of is that the IID have contacted um, Dasset, Easy Crypto, Bitprime, I think nearly about 18 months ago now and requested all of their trading history. So they have that. And I, if I was IID, what I would do is I would write a script and look at, because they've got obviously the IID numbers of everyone and just see what they're returning in their tax returns over the next five years. 
and IRD can always come back five years and, and see, okay, you, you've, you've, you've done these crypto transactions, there's nothing in your tax returns. Hey, we want to have a look at that and just issue a letter on mass scale to those people. Um, so that, that's, I think, what could happen. But right now, I don't think they've got the resources to do that. But that's not to say that could change in the future. Sounds like we all need to move to El Salvador or somewhere where they, it's tax free. <laughs> um, Mark would also like to, could he please have the link for that article um, on your website? I can actually post it in here if you want to. Uh, yep. If I stop sharing my screen, I might be able to pull it up. Yep. Keep going if you like. Um, is, have we got any more questions? Surely there's some questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think the main thing is just knowing when I are going to start. I mean, it's so it's a very difficult, uh, difficult to be able to for them to go through everyone's wallets, etc. They're not going to be able to do that, really, are they? Yeah, it, it's it, it can be incredibly time consuming and incredibly complicated from our end. Um, so, it, like that's probably one of our um, biggest issues at the moment is actually trying to reconcile people's portfolios because they've got so much activity and some of the processes that we use just aren't quite up to scratch compared to ordinary accounting. Ordinary accounting, you've got a bank account, you've got zero accounting software. And although there are some accounting software for these, such as Coinly or Taxoshi or coin tracking, no one's really got it pinpointed down, particularly with some of the complexities over decentralized finance transactions or or pancake swap, or, or now we're seeing all of a sudden these cross chain cross chain transactions. Um, there's a lot going on, and, and all the blockchains are different, and there's so many that no one can keep no one can keep up with them. So that's where some of the real complicated um, transactions come around. Yeah. Um, John would like to know how. What about if he he you know he said. Um, if Bitcoin was bought in 2018 while being in another country, would it still be taxable? Um, again, a couple of things come to mind there. Um, firstly, it depends on your intention, why you purchase it. And if you purchase with the intention to suppose it's likely to be taxable income. The only exception or exemption that comes to mind there is that there's something, something called a, a temporary foreign tax um, or a transitional tax residency exemption. And that would apply to you if you've been out of New Zealand for more than 10 years. Um, again, there's an article on our website about this, but uh, th that would be the only exemption that apply. And, and for that to apply, you'd need to be a, a new migrant coming to New Zealand or, or a New Zealand citizen that's gone away for 10 years come back and then you have an exemption in New Zealand on foreign source income and then because you've acquired that Bitcoin overseas you need to then dispose it overseas within this four-year time frame that would probably be the only uh, exemption that would apply for a non-taxable position there so rather than actually looking at the income tax act around intention and sell you're looking at something that overrides that that's available for transitional tax residents. Wow. Okay. Um, and if you buy Bitcoin over a period and sell Bitcoin over a period, is it last on first off? Uh, so what I think you're referring to there, Jonathan, is something to do with the inventory calculation method. Um, so that, that's how you keep track of your closing cryptocurrency balances um, to determine that purchase price. So th there's three options that come to mind. Um, one is the last in, last out method or LIFO, and that's actually not uh, an allowable method in New Zealand. Um, so we can completely ignore that one, which leaves something called weighted average cost. And what that would mean is if you bought one token for $100 and you bought another token for $1,000, the weighted average cost is therefore one token at um, $550. So that when you sell, that weighted average cost is the deduction price. Um, or the other method is first in, first out. So therefore, in that case, um, when you sold the token, the first one that you purchased for $100 would be the deduction price. So what we see is that in a bull market cycle, like we've experienced up until um, the end of last year, weighted average cost is best, and that pre presents the best outcome for taxpayers. But if you're buying in a declining market, then obviously um, you want the biggest deduction um, up front, so first in, first out. But 
uh, what you do need to be is be consistent throughout the year. So once you elect one method, you need to apply that method throughout the rest of your time owning crypto or until you reset completely out to zero. So we've been a fan of using the weighted average cost, cost method because over the cryptocurrency period since 2017 that we've been involved, um, most people tend to be far better off using that calculation method. Um, okay, uh, Mark would also like to know, in that example, when you sell, is it always compared with the New Zealand dollar? What happens in a hyperinflation environment? Are you looking at massive taxable profit? Yeah, so Income Tax Act says that everything's reported in New Zealand dollars to the IRD. So, um, yeah, every transaction is converted to New Zealand dollars based on the market value at the time. So again, what we do is we take every transaction, we value that transaction based on lookups on historical data of that token. We've got list of tokens on every single date. The average, uh, I think we've got both the average that day and the close per day. And again, we have to be consistent with that. And then we've got an exchange rate table as well. So every single trade, um, this internal software that we've created looks at the, the token being sold or purchased the date of the transaction converts it to US dollars, then converts it to New Zealand dollars. And then the accounting systems and calculations take over that New Zealand dollar value. Um, as far as hyperinflation and that kind of concept, uh, I think that's going to apply for every business. I don't think that's kind of crypto specific, even if you're in the business of banking or, or property investing or a supermarket, those same hyperinflation principles are going to apply to you. So I don't think that's anything crypto related. Are you finding that you're getting more and more cryptocurrency clients? Uh, we've been saying no to them since about the end of last year because we're just too busy. So, oh, wow, yeah. really? My gosh. Yeah. yeah, so we're only taking on quite selective clients. Um, yeah, we made the decision. Um, yeah, we'd rather service quite a small amount of clients incredibly well rather than just doing everyone and anyone. And, and because of the, what's involved, we can be quite expensive because um, the time. There, there's a lot of, yeah, and, and the systems aren't there. So that's why we've created our own systems. But as I mentioned in the record keeping, we're really only as good as the information that our client presents to us. Um, so it can be quite time inclusive from both us and the client to give us that information. And that's why I talk quite a lot around strategy because it's actually the clients that make the most money, their accounts are the most simplest and they've got the less risk profile um, because they don't do as much. And then we can help them out with other things like restructuring or being more strategic in structures to save them more tax because there's less going on. Are there many other um, cryptocurrency specific accountants out there in New Zealand? Uh, there are a couple. Um, there's a lady at EY. She used to be a senior investigator at IRD, so we got to know her pretty well. And um, yeah, we obviously consult with her quite a lot with her um, specialties too. Yep. And I think there's another guy in the, in the Waikato as well. Um, he's done a few presentations with Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand too. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, Peter would like to know, can you claim lost Bitcoin for tax purposes? i.e. one Bitcoin lost, but still two Bitcoin disposed in 2022? Um, I'm not quite sure I follow you there, but, but if you, if you do, do you mean, Peter, that you've lost Bitcoin in terms of you've sent it to a wrong address and therefore you've lost it? Or do you mean you've lost on the sale of Bitcoin in terms of you've sold it for less than what you purchased it for? In both situations, the... Um, outcome is that the loss will be tax deductible. Loss um, key, he said. Yeah, so, so therefore, um, yeah, but again, you'd need to show if IRD were to question that, um, because you'd clearly have a big loss in your tax return, you'd need to show some sort of clear and compelling evidence that you've lost it. And again, this is one of those uncertainties where it hasn't been tested before. So I'm not too sure um, how that would play out. Yeah, Correct. From very a, hard, wouldn't it? Correct, but from an interpretation of the Income Tax Act, yes, the, the, the Bitcoin would be lost, but again, having that proof would, might be difficult in practice. Gosh. Again, no, no, no different from, say, um, again, I used the example of Briscoe's because I can see it across the road out my window, um, but, but they, they would lose stock. It's the reality of any retail store. There's going to be unders and overs on stock tax, but, and again, the onus is on them to prove it. Um, I guess it's just 
if, if depending on your tax return, what's that Bitcoin worth and compared to everything else? Is it material and how much does it stand out? So BFI is going to ask questions about that. Mm. Gosh. Well, thank you very much. If we don't have any more questions, I will let you go. Um, but yes, this will be available on our YouTube channel to look over. And uh, and if anyone would like a copy, oh no, we've got one more question. Um, uh, those clients who make the most money, presumably, they don't actually cash out? Question mark from from Mark. Um, no, you'd be surprised actually. Um, yeah. It's important not, to take your profits, I think, at least a little bit. Um, no, they're not. They're not actually all in on crypto. Um, they, they operate on a completely different level. We've probably got only about a dozen of them, and 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 they're really unique. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a couple that are quite similar. One has a. Um, online advertising business that was making somewhere around three to 400K a year in 2017. So he had a really solid business, it was all, digital, all online. And then he started to invest in crypto and he had a particular competitive advantage in terms of finding ICOs before they came to market. And he's done incredibly well from those. He pays his tax throughout the year. He doesn't leave, leverage his tax money. And then he's actually taken out, he's made probably three or $4 million over the past three years, mostly over the past um, 2022 financial year. But a lot of that's actually gone to shares um, and to buy more websites, more income producing assets. So in his situation and in many others, the crypto has actually grown from maybe 10% of their entire wealth to maybe 25% of the entire wealth. And at some points, it probably has crept up a little bit, but then they actually take it back down to keep that exposure. They, and I guess this probably summarizes it well, is that when the market goes up, they don't think that they're invincible and it's going to keep going. They're quite happy with their level of exposure and they diversify into other income producing assets. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, any more questions just before we go? So been a valuable session thank you so much it's i think it's been on everyone's minds uh tax on cryptocurrency when when you're an investor so uh it's good to get some clarification around it um oh you're welcome it's exciting to be in the space um it, there's so much happening i can't keep up with everything and i, I love it like where else do you get these some, firstly meet some awesome people doing some awesome things and absolutely being able to help them out it, it, it's, yeah it's, i've got a pretty cool job i love it oh that's great well thank you so much for joining us um yeah behalf of everyone at Dasset and um everyone viewing thank you very much and um yeah again it'll be available on our youtube channel cool see you later thank you bye bye everyone <laughs>